What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Earlier last year I made a couple videos talking about Pokemon event distributions and how that mechanic and technology has changed over the years. During the DS era of Nintendo events, there were hundreds of events done in retail stores, at Pokemon competitions, and even at Nintendo stores all around the globe. Out of every single DS event planned for release, only one never saw the light of day. Today we're going to take a look at the mysterious unreleased Winter Celebi. For those who don't know anything about the history of Pokemon Nintendo events, I've linked the last video I've made in the top right of your screen where I talk about the rarest event Pokemon ever released. I suggest checking out both of these to better understand this video, but regardless of that, I'm going to quickly talk about how these events were done. With the introduction of the Nintendo DS, Pokemon events were changed drastically because of all the new features added to the system. Originally, in order to get an event Pokemon, you'd have to go to a retail store, which was usually Toys R Us at the time, and use a Game Boy Advance Link cable or adapter to manually trade the special Pokemon from the copy of the store received from the Nintendo to your game. There were also ones that distributed them over wireless, but unfortunately there isn't a ton of documentation that shows exactly which one was the more common method used. The most notable event out of that era was probably the Mystery Mew, which was given out to promote the DVD release of Lucario and the Mystery of Mew. The cartridge was completely filled with Mews, including the party, which resulted in 426 Mews that could be traded through one cartridge. These files were cloned to every event cartridge, which means that every copy had the exact same Mews for trade. With the introduction of the DS games, this method was refined and improved. Because of the addition of built-in wireless and Wi-Fi capabilities, distribution carts were created to make this process a lot easier for retail associates, as well as the people coming in to receive the event. These cartridges were very basic as they didn't contain the actual game, just the event to distribute the Pokemon or key item for that specific event. All the employee had to do was start up the game and it would send out a wireless signal that activated if a customer started up the game they was compatible with. The DS could then just be closed and tucked behind the counter and it would distribute an infinite amount of Pokemon until the system was shut down or the download was stopped. Because these events were a time-based promotion, they were intended to be sent back to Nintendo to be disposed of. which. Well, I wouldn't be making this video if that's what people actually did. Although the paperwork and even the cartridges said that they had to be sent back to Nintendo, a lot of them somehow appeared on online markets. The most interesting thing about these is the fact that even the ones sent back to Nintendo appear online as well. It's very obvious to tell this because the ones that were sent back were cut almost in half of the contacts, so even if they threw them out, they wouldn't be usable. While this probably destroyed a ton of them, a lot of them still worked or were able to be repaired to be completely functional. As a result, these cartridges are very sought after by collectors for their low production amount, as well as for the fact that it's a physical piece of Nintendo and Pokemon's history. Because these cartridges are basically available to the global market, fans were able to rip a copy of the ROM on the cartridge and play them on flash carts, emulators, and understand how the game was actually coded. With all this information, they were able to discover something that could have gone completely unknown if they were never taken outside of the stores. In late December of 2010, Game Freak and Nintendo revealed that a new event was going to be available at GameStop, which allowed customers to obtain a shiny Raikou, Entei, and Suicune at their local stores, which was unheard of for a couple of reasons. This was the first DS event for the West that contained more than two Pokemon, with the only other being the Jirachi and Pikachu Colored Pichu event that released the year prior to this event. This was also the first event where every single Pokemon was shiny on the cartridge. This event was compatible with Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Heart Gold, and Soul Silver, which means that literally anyone that had a DS copy of any of the games could get each of the legendary beasts. This event already took place in Japan around June of 2010 to promote the new movie, Zoroark Master of Illusions, where all three of these Pokemon were present in the film. The interesting thing to note about this cartridge is although there were three different events for three different weeks, this event was put onto one singular cartridge. This isn't technologically impressive by any means, but this was the first of its kind, so I assume they did this to cut down on production costs. In some later events, cartridges had multiple Pokemon available, but they were all tied to one Wonder Card, which means that you could get only one of all the Pokemon per save file. Once this cartridge got in the hands of the public, there was something very interesting they found when they checked out the ROM. Just like the other events, based on the DS's internal clock, the game distributed Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. But for some reason, there was one more Pokemon included. Celebi was also included on the cart after the other events were supposed to end, but this wasn't referenced in any part of the promotion that Nintendo revealed. Surprisingly, this info was discovered during the event, so if customers convinced GameStop employees to change the DS's clock, not only could they get all three legendary beasts at once, but they could also get the mysterious Celebi. Nowadays, these cartridges are relatively easy to come by on sites like eBay, and compared to a majority of others, you can get it for a somewhat reasonable price of around $100. 
A lot of the ones like the mythicals go for $300 to $400, and that's mostly because you can get a shiny Raikou in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, whereas Pokemon like Mew aren't obtainable outside of an event in any of the DS games. Technically, these are illegal to buy and sell because there's a big not for resale notice on the cartridge, so I most certainly didn't buy one of these. I found mine like everyone else. Coincidentally, on the side of the road while I was taking a nice walk. So let's start this game up and see what it's all about. Before we start the game, we have to make sure our DS's clock is set to the correct time on the DS that contains a distribution card. Because Nintendo knew that people would probably try to steal these games to either resell or get unlimited Pokemon, they coded the game to only work during the days that the event was available in real life. It only took like 8 minutes for people to find out that they could just change the DS's clock to the week of the event, which was honestly a really poor attempt in stopping people from using them. Considering that they really couldn't make these carts connect to Wi-Fi because it would make them useless if the store's power or internet went out, I imagine this was probably the only local solution that they could come up with to prevent that kind of situation. To be honest, this conflict is probably one of the main reasons why they switched their in-store distributions into Code Cards or the new Pokemon Pass app that recently came out. After changing the clock, we can start the game, which immediately starts the distribution. It first says that it's pending while it checks that the date matches up with the event, and then it says that the event is distributing the Pokemon once the date is confirmed. If the date isn't correct, it will say, Distribution is not available now. On the bottom screen it says Channel with a number, which I assume works in the same way as a walkie-talkie. It has multiple channels, so if more than one is active, there won't be any sort of interference. I'm not really sure when that would ever really be a problem, aside from having to use multiple DS's in an extremely large store, but I guess that's an interesting feature. So for the main events, if we set the time between January 3rd to January 9th, we can get Raikou, January 17th to the 23rd for Entei, and January 31st to February 6th for Suicune. As for Celebi, if we set the time from February 27th to March 20th, we can get the unreleased event. The weirdest part about this event is the fact that it isn't just something loosely thrown in there. It's a completed event. It has a special original trainer, an exclusive held item, the event Cherish Ball, and even a completed Wonder Card. Upon further inspection, it was discovered this was actually supposed to be the Celebi event that eventually released on the 21st of February until March 6th of that year. The only difference between the two is that the OT was changed from GameStop to Win 2011, which was short for Winter 2011, and the Trainer ID changed from 02271 to 02211 for some reason. Aside from those changes, it works exactly the same as the actual event. If you have it in Heart Gold and Soul Silver and go to the Elex Forest, you can do the event where you go back in time to battle Giovanni, and in Black and White you can use it to get the exclusive Zoroa. I'm not sure if this is because it has a classic ribbon or because it was caught in a Cherish Ball, but it's really interesting how well planned out this was. They could have started at any date, but just chose not to. So what went wrong? There's never been any confirmation as to what really happened behind the scenes, but I have quite a few theories as to why this was never released. The first thing to note is the date. February 21st, 2011 was the 15th anniversary of Pokemon Red and Green releasing in Japan, which seemed to be the original intention for the event. Considering that they didn't have any promotions or celebration going on, they probably just chose to repurpose it for the release of the 13th movie. Selby plays a notable role in the movie, so it really seemed like a perfect storm. Another thing to note is that once the Beast went out of event rotation, they immediately released as a Wi-Fi event for those who couldn't go to the stores. They may have originally planned to go from in-store to Wi-Fi in the same fashion for Celebi, but because the Pokemon Black and White Mall tour was going on at that point, I imagine they figured they could capitalize off that a lot more by enticing players to buy the upcoming games while they grab their Celebi. Other small things like contracts and licensing agreements between GameStop and Nintendo might have conflicted with that, but to be honest, I don't think we'll actually ever find out why this never came out. Overall, I think this is a really neat piece of Pokemon history that very few people know about. Is it important? Not really, but it's definitely a neat thing to own, as well as to theorize why it never came to be. I'd really like to make a video going over as many of these distribution cards as I can, and a lot of them are just as interesting as this one. So if you'd like to see that, let me know in the comments section below. It's a little bit out of the realm of the content I normally make, so I'd really love to hear your feedback for this video. Aside from that, that's all there is to say about the unreleased Winter Celebi. And that's going to do it for today's video. I just want to thank my good friend Sonix for helping me with some of the footage for this video. I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to him as he mainly does shiny hunts, but he's working on content similar to mine that will be coming out in the near future. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing as we'll be making more videos like these soon. 
If you want to get access to my videos one day before everyone else, consider becoming a member on the channel to also get sub badges, special emotes, and support my channel to help me with new content. If you have any suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.